Hello, everyone. Happy Sunday. It is April 7th. We're happy to have you all here with us today on this next session of The Guardian. Quick piece of information for those of you who are joining us right now. Violetta is an artist and graphic designer living in Point Noir in the Republic of Congo and is a co-founder with Adib Masumian of the Utterance Project. Violetta is also a researcher, a writer, and presenter on Baha'i history. She has given over 50 talks on Clearwater Baha'is YouTube channel and also the Baha'i Center of Clearwater Facebook page. It's, it's really nice. You can go there and look at them right now. There's a lot of cool playlists. You should check them out. And further to that, Violetta is the author of four online illustrated chronologies on the lives of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, Abdul Baha, and the one that we are presenting now, Shohi Effendi. All links and details can be found in the description below in the video. Which, Without much further ado, we'll start this next session. Thank you, Violetta, for joining us. We're so happy to have you here for The Guardian. Thank you. Oh, it's such an honor to be here. I have come to look at Sunday as the beginning of my week. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, and wonderful. we see it says The Guardian Part 5. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to say a couple of things before I jump in. One is I am so happy to see everyone here on Zoom with us, but also those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, and on the live stream on YouTube, and also those of you who are going to be watching this on YouTube later. I am also speaking to you when I give these talks. I think of you the entire time. It's not just for the live audience. Um, this part, part five, from 1921 to 1922, Sholi Effendi becomes the guardian. I wanna say a couple of things before I begin. One is I got a question about why did I call this Shogi Effendi Becomes the Guardian. Somebody told me Shogi Effendi was the guardian his whole life. I called this part Shogi Effendi Becomes the Guardian because Shogi Effendi himself said, I stopped being a normal human being when I became the guardian. That's why I titled it this way. This part is 66 pages long. Last week's part, part four, was 41 pages long. I'm not going to be able to read word for word all 66 pages because the narration of the chronology is imbued with the energy of those of you who are here and the energy of the storytelling, where it takes me. Uh, the written chronology functions very much as an encyclopedia in a sense. Um, for example, I'll give you an example of something I'm going to cut. Um, the Greatest Holy Leaf wrote hundreds of letters to communities all around the world as soon as Shogi Effendi became the guardian to encourage them to come under the shadow, the protective shadow of the guardian. And her letters are sublime. Some of them are extremely long and passionate. And I had 21 excerpts in the chronology of these letters. And I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to read my favorite. I'm going to read one. So please, 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 when you receive the email from me tonight with the link to the chronology, go to the chronology and read all of those testimonials from the greatest holy leaf. The second thing I want to say is we say goodbye now to Shogi Effendi's youth. We, we say goodbye to Oxford. We say goodbye to him as a normal human being in his own words. And we discover the guardian, this protector of the covenant, the head, the worldwide head of the Baha'i faith, that mantle thrust upon his shoulders at the age of 24. It's going to be a very powerful and emotional session, and we're going to start right now. This part covers one year in the life of Shoghi Effendi, from the age of 24 in 1921 to the age of 25 in 1922. 28 November to 28 December 1921, in Haifa, before Shohi Effendi's arrival from London, 
the ascension of Abdul Baha. Statements by Abdul Baha referring to the end of his earthly life. This is a collage of photographs of Abdul Baha walking away, walking away from the camera to um, illustrate the end of his earthly life, him leaving us, but not without the protection of the guardian. You can find all these photographs and their um, captions in part nine of the extraordinary life of Abdul Baha, my very first chronology. For several years before his passing, and with increasing frequency as the date of his ascension approached, Abdul Baha made passing comments about his death. Eight years before his passing, he said, remember whether or not I be on earth, my presence will be with you always. He had many premonitory dreams. In September 1921, two months before his passing, he spoke and he said this about his premonitory dream. I seem to be standing within a great mosque in the inmost shrine facing the Qibli in the place of the Imam himself. I became aware that a large number of people were flocking to the mosque. As I stood, I raised loudly the call to prayer. Suddenly, the thought came to me to go forth from the mosque. When I found myself outside, I said within myself, for what reason came I forth, not having led the prayer? But it matters not. Now that I've uttered the call to prayer, the vast multitude will of themselves chant the prayer. This is another exquisite photograph of Abdul Baha from the back, colorized and available on Baha'i Media Bank. A few weeks before his passing, cable Shori Effendi to return at once. Friends, this is the determining event in Shori Effendi's life. It is a story of disobedience to Abdul Baha, and it is a story of the consequences that that disobedience will have on Shori Effendi for the rest of his life. A few weeks before his passing, Abdul Baha suddenly entered the room where Shori Effendi's father was and said, Cable. Shori Effendi to return at once. Shori Effendi's mother, Zia Echanum, consulted with his grandmother, Munir Echanum. And after consultation, the family decided that to send a cable would risk shocking Shori Effendi unnecessarily. They opted instead to write a letter conveying Abdul Baha's message to soften the blow. When Abdul Baha had asked them to cable Shori Effendi, he was in perfect health. So the family didn't think there was this element of urgency. The family second guessed Abdul Baha because they didn't realize, in fact, they never would have dreamed that Abdul Baha at that point only had a few weeks left to live on this planet. And they all lost sight of a critical moment that Abdul Baha was always right and that he should always be categorically obeyed. The letter arrived in England after Abdul Baha had passed away. Shori Effendi had been deprived of the bounty of seeing his beloved grandfather alive one last time. For the rest of his life, Shori Effendi would say repeatedly that he felt that if he had been able to see Abdul Baha before his ascension, he was sure that the master would have given him special words of advice, given him instructions, and provided him with comfort. But beyond this, really, he would have been able to gaze on the face of Abdul Baha one last time, the single most important person in his life. Unwittingly, by not strictly obeying Abdul Baha's directive, the family had caused Shori Effendi what would be lifelong pain. This story goes a very long way in explaining what Amatul Baharuya Hanum calls, quote, the sense of abandonment, of unworthiness, 
of passionate longing for his grandfather that assailed Shori Effendi so strongly during the early years of his guardianship. The week before the ascension of Abdul Baha, this absolutely extraordinary photograph, you see Abdul Baha carrying a coffin. He is a pallbearer. This photograph was given to me by the United States National Baha'i Archives with permission to use in the chronology of the extraordinary life of Abdul Baha. A very grainy, very cropped version of this photograph was published in Star of the West, volume 12, number eight on page 281. Uh, Abdul Baha is carrying the coffin of Mirza Hassan Afna, and it is one of the last photographs ever taken of Abdul Baha. Haji Mirza Abul Afnan was an eminent Baha'i and a direct relative of the Bab. He was the son of Haji Mirza Abul Kazim, the older brother of Khadija Bagum, the wife of the Bab. He'd lived for a long time in Haifa. But on the 19th of November, 1921, he had this premonition that Abdul Baha was going to die in the next few days. And so... This is one of the very few stories of suicide in the heroic age of the faith. Uh, he, he threw himself into the sea and his body washed up uh, on the shore of the Mediterranean on the 20th of November. And Abdul Baha carried his coffin two days, uh, a week before his own passing. And he implored the friends not to harm themselves Uh, three days before his passing on Friday, the 25th of November, was a very busy day for the master. Uh, he attended the very last prayer at the mosque of his earthly life. He wrote a last tablet that was addressed to the Baha'is of Germany, more specifically Stuttgart. And he married Ara Husra, who had been in his household since the age of six and was a cook. He insisted on marrying him, officiating his marriage, if you will. Then on Saturday, the 26th of November, Abdul Baha caught a fever, which disappeared the next day. The last visitor of the day was a head of police, an Englishman, and Abdul Baha gave him a gift of a silk handwoven handkerchief and then retired to bed around 8.30 p.m. Abdul Baha's very last concern before his passing was for the health of every single member of the Holy Family, of every single pilgrim and every single resident Baha'i. And when he was informed they were all in good health, the master said, very good, very good. Two of his daughters, Ruha and Munavar Hanum, stayed with him as Abdul Baha fell asleep on Sunday, very calmly, free of fever. This is a photograph of the bedroom and the bed where Abdul Baha passed away at Seven Haparsim in Haifa. You see the posts on the bed. There was a mosquito net around it. This will come into the story as I tell it. Abdul Baha woke at 1.15 a.m. on Monday, November 28th, rose from his bed, walked across the room to a table and drank some water. He was too warm, so he took off a layer of clothing and he returned to bed and he asked his daughter Ruha to lift the mosquito net, telling her, I, I have difficulty breathing. Give me more air. Abdul Baha drank a little, and when one of his daughters offered him food, he replied in a clear voice, giving them a beautiful look. You wish me to take some food, and I am going. Less than a minute later, Abdul Baha had passed away peacefully. His face was so beautiful, so calm and serene, that his daughters, for a moment, felt like he had just fallen asleep. 29 December 1921, the cablegram. This is the original cablegram that was sent to all Baha'is of the world by the greatest holy leaf. It's found in Star of the West. Now that Abdul Baha had passed away, everything rested on the shoulders of the greatest holy leaf, his beloved sister. 
She was the head of the faith until Shori Effendi arrived, and she had to make all of the decision. She had to keep the Baha'i faith safe until the arrival of Shori Effendi. She had to make all of the decisions regarding the place where they would bury Abdul Baha. And she sent a cable on the 29th of December, 1921, which simply read, His Holiness Abdul Baha ascended to Abha Kingdom, signed Greatest Holy Leaf. Monday, the 28th of December, 1921, how Abdul Baha's burial spot was chosen. This is a photograph of the inside of the shrine, the innermost shrine of Abdul Baha on Mount Carmel in the shrine of the Bab. When the greatest holy leaf was looking for a place that would be suitable enough to bury the holy remains of Abdul Baha, Abbas Kuli, the custodian of the shrine of the Bab, approached her and told her a story that went back 12 years, the day of the burial of the remains of the Bab on the 21st of March, 1909. After the burial had been complete and Abdul Baha had wept over the open coffin, he passed by an empty vault immediately next to the shrine of the, the, the vault where the sarcophagus of the Bab and his remains were laid to rest. And he told Abbas Kuli, pointing to the passageway to that next vault, and this should be a place for us. The greatest holy leaf had found the place to inter her beloved and saintly brother. She told Abbas Kuli before blessing him for his help, very well, this is where it will be. The entire world sent condolences to Abdul Baha. I want to advance the story so I will not read them, but I direct you to part nine of The Extraordinary Life of Abdul Baha. I have put all of them there. On Tuesday, the 29th of November, the day after Abdul Baha's passing was his funeral. This is another photograph given to us by the United States National Baha'i Archives. And it is a funeral cortege of Abu Baha with his casket carried aloft by pallbearers. You can see his casket right here, covered in a simple cloth. At 9 a.m., the funeral cortege left the house of Abdul Baha on 7 Haparsim with thousands of people in the streets. Thousands of people who knew Abdul Baha because Abdul Baha had spent the last 40 years of his life ministering to them. Sir Ronald Storrs, the governor of Jerusalem, was deeply moved by the funeral and said, I have never known a more united expression of regret and respect than was called forth by the utter simplicity of the ceremony. The same period of time, 28 November to 28 December 1921, Shohi Effendi learns of the ascension of Abdul Baha. This is the same cablegram that we saw earlier, but I decided to invert the colors, make it white on black instead of black on white, because this was a very difficult moment in Shoghi Effendi's life. The failure of Abdul Baha's family to instantly obey the master's request and cable Shoghi Effendi to return at once, weeks before his passing, had a catastrophic effect on, show, on the 24-year-old Shori Effendi, for whom Abdul Baha was the son around which he revolved. His life at its center had Abdul Baha. Words will always fail human understanding to describe the love that Shoghi Effendi felt for Abdul Baha. We cannot put words to it and we cannot understand it. In the 1920s, the address of Major Wesley Tudor Pohl in London was often used as the distributing point for cables and letters from Abdul Baha in the Holy Land to the British Baha'is. And so Shoghi Effendi, whenever he traveled to London from Oxford, always called in on Major Tudor Pohl. On the 29th of November, 1921, at 9.30 in the morning, Major Tudor Pro received the greatest holy leaves. 
seven word cable about Abdul Baha's passing. Major Tudor Pole immediately notified the British friends by cable, by phone, and by letter. And he called Shoghi Effendi personally to come to his office in order to break the news in person as gently and human, as gently as humanly possible. Shoghi Effendi was not one who could be informed of this news by cable or a phone call. It had to be in person. By noon, Shoghi Effendi was at Major Tudor Pole's London office and entered his inner office at 61 St. James Street. He was shown in, and as would happen, Major Tudor Pole was not in his office at the moment. So Shoghi Effendi was standing at Major Tudor Pole's desk and his eyes just fell on this cable from the greatest holy leaf that was lying open on the desk. Sh Shoghi Effendi read the cable and discovered the devastating news alone. He didn't discover the news the way the grandson of Abu Baha should have discovered the news. He he got the news of the death of the most important person in his life, like any other regular Baha'i, by reading a cable. Major Tudopol entered his office just a moment after Shoghi Effendi had collapsed. He was dazed. He was utterly bewildered by this catastrophic news. And in a state of shock, Shoghi Effendi was taken to the home of Baha'i in London called Miss Grand. He was put to bed in her house for a few days as he became, began the long process of recovering from the greatest tragedy of his life. Shoghi Effendi's sister Ruhangis, Lady Blumfield, and several other British Baha'is did everything they could to comfort him to no avail. He was utterly grief-stricken. For several days, Shoghi Effendi was unable to move. This will happen again in his life, this inability to move. 21 November, 1921, a letter from Dr. S. Lamont. Such a good, such a kind friend. He says, Shori, if dearest Shori, it was indeed a bolt out of the blue when I got Tudor Paul's message wire this morning. It must be very hard for you. What will you do now? I suppose you will go back to Haifa. I cannot imagine how heartbroken you must feel and how you must long to be at home and what a terrible blank you must feel in your life. He invited him to stay with him in Bournemouth and Shoghi Effendi accepted before starting to make preparations in earnest to go back to Haifa. December 1st, 1921, Shoghi Effendi's state immediately after learning of Abdul Baha's ascension. When Dr. Lutfullah Hakim, a future member of the Universal House of Justice, visited Shoghi Effendi two days after the ascension of Abdul Baha, he found him in bed absolutely overcome with grief. He was unable to eat. He was unable to sleep. He was, in his own words, overwhelmed in body and mind. And he laid in bed a couple of days, in the words of Shoghi Effendi, almost senseless, absent-minded, and greatly agitated. Eventually, during Dr. Hakim's visit, Shoghi Effendi recovered enough to translate and chant the last tablet he had received from the grandfather he had just lost to his host, Miss Grand. And they began making plans for Shoghi Effendi to travel to Haifa, accompanied by Lady Blumfield, a very devoted friend of the family, and Abdul Baha's host during his travels to London in 1920. 12 and 1913, and two other Baha'is. December 2nd to the 7th, Shoghi Effendi's words about the passing of Abdul Baha. In an undated letter that Shoghi Effendi wrote between the 2nd and the 7th of December, Shoghi Effendi writes astonishing words about the passing of Abdul Baha and its implications for the ushering in of a new era 
for the Baha'i faith, as well as his enduring connection with Abdul Baha beyond this plane and into the Abha kingdom. And this is now a quote from Shoghi Effendi's letter. Gradually, his power revived me and breathed in me in confidence that I hope will henceforth guide me and inspire me in my humble work of service. The stir which is now aroused in the Baha'i world is an impetus for this cause and will awaken every faithful soul to shoulder the responsibilities which the Master hath now placed upon every one of us. The Holy Land will remain the focal center of the Baha'i world. A new era will soon come upon it. The Master in his great wisdom has consolidated his work and his spirit assures me that its results will soon be manifest. There is another letter from another dear friend, comforting Shoghi Effendi, but you will be able to read this on the, on the website. I'm going to try and advance to the point where Shoghi Effendi leaves Haifa. Leaves for Haifa. 7 to the 29th of December, 1921, Shoghi Effendi's journey to the Holy Land. 7 to 16th, December, 1921, in London, prior to the journey. This is a... I chose this picture because it's... It was taken in 1921 the year that Abdul Baha passed away, and because it's kind of a desolate photograph of London, not the usual Tower Bridge, Big Ben. I, I liked that uh, about it. Shoghi Effendi was still overcome with grief, but pressed on very courageously, returning to London after spending five days with his dear friend, Dr. S. Lamont in Bournemouth. And he tried to book a passage to the Holy Land as soon as possible, uh, because he had received a telegram from the Greatest Holy Leaf the day before on the 7th of December saying, come as soon as you can, please. I'm paraphrasing. Um, at a meeting of the friends uh, in Miss Grant's apartment on the 8th of December, where they were bidding farewell to Shoghi Effendi, Shoghi Effendi was still wearing his overcoat. And the room was heated, but he was still wearing his overcoat. The friends asked him, don't you want to take your coat off? It's warm. Shoghi Effendi replied, that when he had left the Holy Land for England, his grandfather had told him to always wear that overcoat in winter. Unfortunately, due to uh, passport issues, Shoghi Effendi wasn't able to leave the Holy Land as soon as he wanted. So his departure was slightly delayed. 16th of December, 1921, Shoghi Effendi set sail for Haifa, this is a 1921 passenger liner, not the one Shoghi Effendi took. Um, it's just so beautiful that I wanted to put the image here uh, just to think of Shoghi Effendi on a steamship. Shoghi Effendi eventually left on the 16th of December, 18 days after the ascension of Abdul Baha. He left with Lady Blumfield and his sister Ruhangis and their boat docked in Egypt from which they would board a train. On the 29th of December, Shoghi Effendi arrives in Haifa. This is the East Haifa train station in 1931, 10 years after Shoghi Effendi arrives. Shoghi Effendi, Lady Blumfield and Ruhangis arrived by train from Egypt at 5.20 p.m. on the 29th of December, 1921, exactly one month after the passing of Abdul Baha. He was welcomed by a group of Baha'i friends. The agony of bereavement had taken such a toll on Shoghi Effendi that he was so frail that he had to be helped up the stairs to the master's house. And inside that home was the only person who could ever comfort Shoghi Effendi, the person who would be his pillar for the next 11 years. I'm speaking, of course, of Abdul Baha's younger sister, Bahi Hanum, the greatest holy leaf, who was the second most important person in Shoghi Effendi's life. He was confined to bed for several days, utterly devastated by the grief. He stayed in his old room at first, but he was soon moved to a room in the house of one of his aunts, while the greatest holy leaf had two rooms and a bath built for him on the roof of the master's home. For the first three days of Shoghi Effendi's arrival in Haifa, the 29th, 
the 30th and the 31st of December, the greatest holy leaf did not show Shoghi Effendi, the will and testament of Abdu'l-Bahá. But on the 1st of January, she could no longer wait. Shoghi Effendi had to know the Baha'i faith needed its guardian. 1st of January, 1922, Shoghi Effendi is read Abdul Baha's Will and Testament. This is a photograph, a stunning photograph from the Baha'i World News Service of the opening pages of the Will and Testament of Abdul Baha. Although Shoghi Effendi had been informed that Abdul Baha had left a letter for him, he had absolutely no knowledge of the contents of the document. At the most, Shoghi Effendi expected, due to his rank as the master's eldest grandson, that Abdul Baha might have left instructions regarding the election of the Universal House of Justice, and maybe that he was the one to be designated as the convener of the conference to elect the Universal House of Justice. Shoghi Effendi had no foreknowledge of the institution of the guardianship. It's very important to remember this. He did not know that the guardianship existed. He had no idea he would be the guardian. He was only a child under the age of 12 by the time Shoghi Effendi, uh, by the time Abdul Baha had finished writing the will and testament. Knowledge of his new station as guardian of the cause of Baha'u'llah, the sign of God on earth, instantly changed Shoghi Effendi. Whatever he was before, he was no longer. He knew from having been so close to Abdul Baha in his childhood years and seeing him be the center of the covenant, he knew what being the head of the faith implied. He knew that same burden of holding and protecting the covenant, of safeguarding and propagating the faith, which had rested on the shoulders of the three central figures before him, was now going to rest on his shoulders. In perhaps the most heartbreaking and poignant sentence of the entire priceless pearl, Ruhiya Khanum recalls Shoghi Effendi telling her, when they read the master's will to me, I ceased to be a normal human being. Shoghi Effendi was now the guardian of the Baha'i faith, and Abdullah's will and testament needed to be read publicly. Third of January, 1922, Shoghi Effendi struggles with the will and testament. This is a photograph of Shoghi Effendi, undated, from Blessings Beyond Measures, the memoirs of Ali Yazdi. Louise Bosch, an American pilgrim, saw Shoghi Effendi after he had been read the Will and Testament and recalled that he objected so strenuously uh, that his own mother, Zia Yehanum, recalled to him now in the days after Muhammad's ascension, one of the imams refused to take over the mantle of leadership too. And she asked her son, are you going to repeat the past history of that imam who also felt he was not qualified? Three to seven January, 1922, three readings of the will and testament of Abdu'l-Bahá. This is the house of the master. On the morning of 3rd January, Jashogi Effendi visited the shrine of the Bab and the tomb of Abdu'l-Bahá. Later that day, Abdu'l-Bahá's will and testament was read aloud to nine men, most of whom were members of the family of Abdu'l-Bahá. Ruhiya Hanum uh, said that Ab Shoghi Effendi was not present because of reasons of ill health and sensitivity on his part. The men witnessed in Abdu'l-Bahá's own, Abdul own handwriting, his seals and his signatures throughout the documents. At Shoghi Effendi's request, a true copy of Abdu'l-Bahá's will and testament was made by one of the men present, a Persian Baha'i. 
I want to direct you to the chronology once more. If you click on this graphic, you will be able to hear excerpts from the will and testament of Abdul Baha in the original Arabic and Persian. It is absolutely magnificent. And I'm not saying this because the utterance project is something I created with Adib Masumian, but I think that when you listen to the holy writings of the Baha'i faith in their original language, in the original language in which they were revealed, you can hear the musicality, you can hear the rhyming, you realize that there is such a depth of beauty to the son sonorities and to the sounds and to the, everything is so beautiful. I really hope that you will take this opportunity and listen to it. It's so important. On the 3rd of January, after the first reading of the Testament, Louise Bosch, an American Baha'i, went over to the house of Abdul Baha after sunset, and she never forgot what she witnessed. Shohi Effendi was coming out of a room, and he entered the room of the greatest holy leaf. He had aged in the space of a few days. He looked like an old man to her. He was walking bent over, and he could hardly speak, could hardly articulate a word. But he came over to Louise Bosch and shook her hand and looked at her for a moment. And he spoke like someone who didn't want to hear anything, didn't want to see anyone. He was such a completely different person than the Shulhi Effendi everyone knew. He was carrying a little candle in his hand and he said to Louise, it is all right. On the 6th of January, 1922, was the 40th day memorial feast. This is just one of my favorite collaborators in the world, is the world's foremost scholar on the Baha'i faith in the Ottoman Empire, Dr. Nijati Alkan. Um, and he uh, was so kind. He gave me this article from Anafir, a Palestinian news, uh, uh, an Ottoman newspaper called The Bugle for Tuesday, the 3rd of January. And uh, in this article, you, you see here, this uh, yellow part here is an announcement of the upcoming 40th day memorial feast. Um, and this short piece here uh, announces the arrival of Shoghi Effendi in Haifa. It says the grandson of the late Abdul Baha Abbas, His Excellence Shoghi Effendi, Shoghi Hadi, returned from London. A group of senior Baha'is received him at the railway station what we learned is that this youth went to that region to finish his studies at the University of Oxford. Perfect. It's exactly what happened. Very factual. Um, but what I want to point out to you is that these happenings in our faith were making the news in a secular newspaper of Ottoman Palestine. The arrival of Shoghi Effendi at the train station is reported. The passing of Abdul Baha, of course, was reported. The 40th day memorial feast is reported, you know, so we tend to think of Baha'i history as our history. But at one point, Baha'i history was part of the history of the land. In accordance with Eastern tradition, there was a 40th day memorial feast on the Friday, January 6, 1922 at 1 p.m. 650 people from Haifa, Akka, neighboring towns and as far away as Syria, Lebanon and Egypt headed by Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Symes, the governor of Phoenicia, the governor of Haifa, government officials, foreign consuls, prominent poets, prominent scholars, Muslims, Christian Jews, and Baha'is of various nationalities all gathered into the home of Abdul Baha at Seven Hapersim. The members of the master's household had arranged a perfectly prepared dinner for more than 600 guests at the banquet and 150 of the poor of Haifa gathered in a special banquet of their own. Uh, the 40th day memorial speeches, not a single one was given by a Baha'i. They were given by Christian poets, a well-known Muslim orator. They were published in the newspaper that I just showed you, Anna Fear the Bugle. You can read all of them in full in part nine of The Extraordinary Life of Abdul Baha. That same day of the banquet was the second reading of Abdul Baha's Will and Testament. 
This is the front gate of the house of the master at seven Happer scene. The will was read a second time publicly to all the people gathered, those 600 people. Um, Shoghi Effendi was not in attendance. Shoghi Effendi was still under shock. He was with the greatest holy leaf. And someone sent a message up to him to say, oh, can you please come? And uh, Shoghi Effendi wrote a message on a piece of paper and it began with the following words. The shock has been too sudden and grievous for my youthful age to enable me to be present at this gathering of the loved ones of beloved Abdul Baha. The next day on the 7th of January was the third reading of Abdul Baha's Will and Testament. This is the a rare photograph of a uh, color photograph of the house of Abdul Baha seen from the back, I think. It's a modern photograph, probably from the 70s or the 80s. Uh, it's on from Baha'i Media, a really wonderful website that provided me with easily 20% of the photographs in this uh, chronology that contains over 1,000 pictures. Uh, the red, the the will and testament of Abdul Baha was read once again on the seventh of January in the large central hall of Abdul Baha's home at Seven Hapar Sin, and the crowd was composed of Baha'is from Persia, India, Egypt, England, Italy, Germany, America, and Japan. It was so large that many people sat on the floor. A prominent Egyptian Baha'i read the will and testament out loud. Each time, Shori Effendi's name was mentioned the entire assembly would rise to their feet. Shoghi Effendi was not present during the reading of the will as well. But it became clear to the people gathered that the responsibility of leading the faith and its affairs had now fallen on the youthful shoulders of Shoghi Effendi, great-grandson of Baha'u'llah, Grandson of Abu Baha, guardian of the cause. 7 to 16 January 1922, the provisions of the will and testament of Abdul Baha are made public. On the 7th of January, the day of the third reading, the provisions of the will and testament of Abdul Baha are made public, are announced to the Persian Baha'is. This is an extraordinary photograph. It's a full page photograph. It's Star of the West, volume 12, number 17, page 20, 258, introducing the Baha'is of the world to the new head of the Baha'i faith. And it says, Shohi, misspelled, Effendi Rabani, grandson of His Holiness Abdul Baha, guardian of the Baha'i cause and head of the House of Justice. Befittingly, it was the greatest holy leaf who made the announcement. She sent two cables to Persia, asking for memorial meetings to be held around the world, and that she was forwarding the will and testament of Abdul Baha. Eight words in the second cable, the greatest holy leaf tells the Baha'is of Persia, Will and testament forwarded Shoghi Effendi Center cause. On the 16th of January, 1922, the provisions of the will and testament are announced to the American Baha'is. This is a photograph of the greatest holy leaf, the sister of Abdul Baha and the great aunt of Shoghi Effendi who held the Baha'is together after the ascension of Abdul Baha, made the crucial decisions, decided on his burial place, sent all the most important cables of this part of the history of the faith, and supported Shoghi Effendi passionately and very actively. Nine days after the first two cables were sent to the Persian Baha'is, on January 16th, the Greatest Holy Leaf sent the following cable to the United States, in will, Shori Effendi appointed guardian of cause and head of House of Justice inform American friends. Immediately after the 16th of January, 1922, Shoghi Effendi is going to translate and circulate the will and testament. So he is the one who translated it. This is a photograph of Abdul Baha. And at the bottom it says, 
I am with you always. This photo of Abdul Baha was taken in San Francisco. Um, almost immediately after these cables were sent, Shoghi Effendi set himself to the painful task of translating it into English. Uh, I want to just quote a little bit from Mr. Ali Nakhshavani, a former member, member of the Universal House of Justice for 40 years, elected to the very first Universal House of Justice, along with our very good friend, Dr. Lutfullah Hakim, whom we've seen and heard from several times in this chronology. He, he puts into context what this translation sort of meant. And I just love it. I love the way he says it. Also, this is uh, probably from uh, the range and power of his pen. You can just Google that and Ali Nakhshavani. I warmly encourage you to read the whole thing. It is a work of art. Uh, Ali Nakhshavani talks about all of the writings of The Guardian, and it is absolutely sublime. It was my um, my guiding light while I was writing this chronology. In the months I was writing this chronology, I depended on that. I held on to Ali Nakhshavani's range and power of his pen for dear life to guide me through understanding the writings of of, of the Guardian. This is what he says about the Shohi Effendi's translation. Here was this 24-year-old youth who had to translate for all time the provisions of a document, which he would later describe as one of the two, three charters of a world civilization. While he was doing the seminal work, he also had to make sure that photostatic copies of his grandfather's will or reliable transcripts were made and duly sent to different Baha'i communities through the East. Sentence by sentence, he had to translate the story of the sufferings endured by Abdul Baha, the disloyalty, the rebellion of his half-brother Mirza Muhammad Ali, the master's prediction of the frustration of all his hopes and those of the people who followed him. There is so much, so much in the uh, in the will and testament of Abdul Baha. It is an ocean. It is a veritable ocean. Evil things were rumbling across the world as Shoghi Effendi was translating Abdul Baha's will and testament into English. The American and the Persian covenant breakers in the United States were counting on the Baha'i faith being very, very weakened, brought to its knees, in fact, by the passing of Abdul Baha. The Guardian made the decision to share the English translation of Abdul Baha's will of in testament in two stages. Immediately after Bahi Khanum had sent cables to the entire Baha'i world, i.e. Persia and America, which were then to be distributed uh, around, Shoghi Effendi compiled eight passages from the Master's will and testament, only eight passages. And in a typical act of humility, he only included one of the eight excerpts about himself, uh, the one that begins, O ye faithful loved ones of Abdul Baha, it is incumbent upon you to take the greatest care of Shoghi Effendi. For he is, after Abdul Baha, the guardian of the cause of God, the Afnan, the hands, pillars of the cause, and the beloved of the Lord must obey him and turn to him. So initially, Shoghi Effendi circulated these eight selections to prepare them for the full translation of the will and testament of Abdul Baha. And shortly after, he did send the full translation. And from the very beginning, Shoghi Effendi repeatedly indicated to Persian and Western Baha'is that the provisions of the will and testament had hidden implications that would be revealed in time. Sixteenth to the twenty fifth of January, nineteen twenty two. The Guardian's first letters to the Baha'i world. So on the 16th, the 21st, and the 25th of January, Shoghi Effendi's first letters to Persian, American, and Japanese Baha'i. This is a very beautiful picture of uh, Baha'is in Japan with Mr. Augur in the center in a kimono. Um, on the 21st of January, Shoghi Effendi wrote his very, very first letter to the American Baha'is, opening with the words, At this early hour, when the morning light is just breaking upon the Holy Land with the gloom of the dear master's bereavement is still hanging thick upon the hearts, I feel as if my shoulder turns in yearning love and full of hope to that great company of his loved ones across the seas. 
to the Japanese Baha'is. Despondent and sorrowful though I be in these darksome days, yet whenever I call to mind the hopes our departed master so confidently reposed in the friends in that far eastern land, hope revives within me and drives away the gloom of his bereavement. Do you see how in the letter addressed to the American Baha'is, Shoghi Effendi is comforting them? And in the letter to the Japanese Baha'is, he is also comforting the Japanese Baha'is, but he's the most heartbroken person in the entire world. Still, he finds the strength to comfort others. On the 19th of January, 1922, Shoghi Effendi writes the passing of Abdul Baha with our adored Lady Blumfield. Can you imagine how hard that must have been? for Shoghi Effendi, to write about the event that traumatized him the most, that broke his heart the most, in such great detail. He gathered his strength, and assisted by Lady Blumfield, they gathered all the material they could find. They collected all the data they could put their hands on, and they began writing, writing a very unique, a very extraordinary type of eulogy. The document they produced was in the form of a 50-page letter, dated 19 January 1922, called The Passing of Abdu'l-Bahá, compiled by Shoghi Effendi and Lady Blumfield, and it was published in 1922 in England. The essay opens with six accounts showing that Abdu'l-Bahá knew his earthly life was coming to a close, in his own words and in his dreams. And it includes um, a tablet to the Baha'is of America revealed two weeks before his passing, they describe in detail the last two days of Abdul Baha's life and his gentle passing, the funeral procession, the funeral, the eulogies, the obituaries in several newspapers. They quote the most touching telegrams of condolences from eminent people like Sir Winston Churchill, His Majesty's Secretary of State for the Colonies, Viscount Allenby, Viscount Allenby. They also describe the Seventh Day Memorial Feast. And they close their magnificent tribute with Abdul Baha's words. Friends, the time is coming when I shall no longer be with you. I have done all that could be done. I have served the cause of Baha'u'llah to the utmost of my ability. I have labored day and night all the years of my life. Oh, how I long to see the loved ones taking upon themselves the responsibilities of the cause. So. What exactly is Abdul Baha's testament? Before going any further with the chronology, I mean the, the will and testament of Abdul Baha is the centerpiece of this part. Um, we have to take a moment to hear what Shoghi Effendi has to say about the importance of the uh the will and testament of Abdul Baha. And I made an infographic uh, of, of the contents of the will and testament. And I invite you to go to the chronology to look at it more in deeply, but these are the main, uh, these are, these are the main, this is the main content. What the will and testament of Abdul Baha represents, uh, Abdul, uh, Abdul Baha describes it, the features of the will and testament's authenticity, the fundamental teachings of the faith, the institution of Baha'u'llah's administrative order, the conduct of individual Baha'is, covenant breaking and covenant breakers, and the sufferings of Abdul Baha. What Shoghi Effendi says about the will and testament is as follows in God Passes By. The document establishing the world order of Baha'u'llah, the charter, of a future civilization uh, is to be regarded in some of its features as supplementary to the Kitabi Akdas. It's signed and sealed by Abdul Baha, it's written entirely in his own hands, and he goes on and uh, describes all of these, all of these, uh, these, these facets. So it reveals an unmistakable language, the twofold character of the mission of the Bab, discloses the full station of the author of the Baha'i Revelation. 
Um, it lauds the courage and constancy of the supporters of Baha'u'llah and the covenant, expatiates on the sufferings endured by its appointed center, recalls the violations of Mirza Muhammad Ali and Mirza Yahya, and uh, also talks about the importance of the Hukullah, but also uh, establishes the guardianship, and it also establishes the Universal House of Justice, which is already prefaced in the Kitabi Akdas, which is why Shoghi Effendi says that the will and testament of Abdul Baha is a supplement to the Kitabi Akdas. Shoghi Effendi also referred to the will and testament of Abdul Baha as an infallible organ for the accomplishment of a divine purpose. Also, the brightest emanation of Abdul Baha's mind his greatest legacy to posterity, an instrument which may be viewed as the charter of the new world order, which is at once the glory and the promise of this most great dispensation. Those words describe will and testament of Abdul Baha. Inside the will and testament of Abdul Baha, there are three provisions for protecting the faith. The first, Abdul Baha appoints his eldest grandson, Shoghi Effendi, as his successor and guardian of the cause of God. The second provision for the protection of the faith in the will and testament of Abdul Baha is that Abdul Baha protects Shoghi Effendi from any possible challenge by not only clearly naming him, but unquestionably elevating his authority above everyone else's. And the last provision for the protection of the covenant in the will and testament of Abdul Baha is Abdul Baha clearly defines the means for the election of the Universal House of Justice, the supreme governing body of the Baha'i faith. In the Will and Testament, there are nine references to Shohi Effendi. In fact, there are more than that. Let me explain. There are nine places in the will and testament where Shoghi Effendi is mentioned. But every time Shoghi Effendi is mentioned, Abdul Baha says several things about him. So I made these little infographics for you. The first mention is in uh, paragraph three. And in paragraph three, it's the first mention of Shoghi Effendi and Abdul Baha refers to him as that primal branch of the divine and sacred lot tree the most wondrous, unique, and priceless pearl that doth gleam from out the twin surging seas, which is where Ruhia Hanum got the title for her book, her biography of Shoghi Effendi called The Priceless Pearl. It's from this part of the Will and Testament of Abdul Baha. The third uh, description of Shoghi Effendi in paragraph three is the blessed and sacred bow that hath branched out from the twin holy trees. Now, the second mention of the guardian appears in paragraph 17 of part one. There are two parts of the Will and Testament, part one and part two. They were, he was, it was written in two parts, several years apart. So paragraph 17, these are the references to Shoghi Effendi. As you see, there are multiple. Shoghi Effendi, the youthful branch that hath branched from the hallowed and sacred lot trees, the fruit grown from the union of the two offshoots of the tree of holiness, the sign of God, the chosen branch, the guardian of the cause of God, the interpreter of the word of God. This is very important. The interpreter of the word of God. This is going to be one of the main themes of the remaining 21 minus 5 is 16. 16 parts of the chronology. The interpreter of the word of God. All of Shoghi Effendi's writings. The third mention of Shoghi Effendi uh, takes place in... Uh, paragraph 18, the very next paragraph, and Abdul Baha calls Shoghi Effendi the sacred and youthful branch. Why were there balloons? And the guardian of the cause of God. Then, the fourth paragraph where Shoghi Effendi is mentioned is uh, in the rest of part one. Um, Paragraph 19, he says, appoint a worthy successor. Paragraph 21, a, these are, um, okay, let me back up. These are mentions of Shoghi Effendi, but in the context of what his role is to be. 
So his role is to, in paragraph 19, appoint a worthy successor. Paragraph 21, he is to appoint the hands of the cause. Paragraph 26, he is the member for life and the head of the Universal House of Justice. And number 28, he is the recipient of Gula. So the eighth mention of Shoghi Effendi is in part two, paragraph 12. And Abdul Baha mentions him three times in that paragraph. He calls him Shoghi Effendi, the twig that hath branched from and the fruit given forth by the two hallowed and divine lotus trees. And finally, the ninth mention of Shoghi Effendi is still in part two, in paragraph 13, the next paragraph after the previous one. And Abdul Baha says four things about Shoghi Effendi in this paragraph. He is after Abdul Baha, the guardian of the cause of God. He that obeyeth him not hath not obeyed God. We're opening the door here for covenant breaking. Some people will become covenant breakers simply because they did not obey Shoghi Effendi. The basis of that is in the will and testament in paragraph 13 of part two. The third thing Abdul Baha mentions is that he that turneth away from him hath turned away from God. This also implies covenant breaking. And he that denieth him hath denied the true one, also a reference to covenant breaking. My friends, we are going to become familiar with covenant breaking in the next section, 30th of January, 1922, covenant breaking and early covenant breakers. My apologies. Covenant breaking, the principle of light and shadow. A lot of the illustrations from this moment on are going to be quite um, abstract and artistic because I would like to see anybody illustrate covenant breaking. I mean, hard. The ministry of the guardian was characterized by a stupendous release of forces which enabled Shohi Effendi to prosecute his divinely ordained charge with colossal success. He single-handedly spread, spearheaded the birth of the administrative order of the cause of Baha'u'llah, lovingly encouraged the nascent institutions worldwide. He increased the endowments of the faith. He, it was a, his guardianship was a colossal success. But also throughout the 36 years of his ministry, at every point he was plagued by untold suffering, agony, anguish, and tribulation at the hands of the covenant breakers. These are the two aspects of the ministry of Shoghi Effendi, the guardianship, light and shadow, his colossal success and his ca catastrophic trials with these covenant breakers. They were just dark-hearted individuals, and at the heart of all covenant breaking is jealousy, uh, insanity, hatred, ego, ambition. These are the things that consume the hearts of covenant breakers. They wanted to discredit the guardian, take over his position. They wanted to become rival factions. They wanted to win Baha'is to their side and their own blatantly false interpretations of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. No one ever succeeded. No one ever succeeded, but they did not stop trying for years, decades. They did manage to win the souls of some of the misguided Baha'is, perhaps those Baha'is who were not as deepened. Um, and to help us understand the covenant breaking, Ruhiya Hanum explains this principle of light and shadow. No proper picture of Shoghi Effendi's life can be obtained without a reference to the subject of covenant breaking. The principle of light and shadow setting each other off, the one intensifying the other, is seen in nature and in history. The sun casts its shadows. At the base of the lamp lies shadows. The brighter the light, the darker the shadow. The evil in men calls to mind the good, and the greatness of the good underlines the evil. There are four types of covenant breaking. Uh, according to one of the most eminent Baha'i scholars of his generation, Dr. Mujan Momin, 
and he outlines them absolutely brilliantly. The first category of covenant breaking is leadership challenges, people who dispute the authority and the legitimacy of the authority of the head of the faith. These include people like Mirza Muhammad Ali and Mason Rimi after the Guardian's passing. There is also dissidence. So individuals who disagree with the policies of the head of the faith, but they don't claim leadership. These include people like Ahmad Sohrab and Ruth White, which unfortunately for you, you're going to become very familiar with. These are some characters. The third type of covenant breaking is disobedience. These are believers who disobey a direct instruction from the head of the faith, such as ceasing to associate with covenant breakers. If they're told to cease and they don't, they become covenant breakers. This is disobedience. And we saw the groundwork for this category of covenant breaking laid very clearly in the will and testament of Abdul Baha, where he says that anybody who disobeys Shoghi Effendi is basically a covenant breaker. The last type of covenant breaker, according to Dr. Mujan Momin's analysis, is vicious attacks. This category are former Baha'is who maliciously attack the faith. And in this category, the one who claims the number one prize of evilness, evil, is uh, Avari. And you're going to get to know him as well. So with the passing of Abdul Baha, old enemies of his are emboldened to resurface. Now, I made a decision that was a design decision when I began these sections. I decided I was going to use images of reptiles uh, to, <laughs> to talk about the covenant breakers because that's what they are. Um, so anyway, if you disagree with my illustrations, write me a strongly worded email. I will put my email in the chat for that. Towards the end of Abdul Baha's ministry, the old band of covenant breakers, led by Mirza Muhammad Ali, the archbreaker of the covenant of Baha'u'llah, and the faithless half-brother of Abdul Baha, they'd sort of receded into the shadows because the end of Abdul Baha's life was just majesty, dignity, glory. He was knighted by the British Empire. He was a hero of World War I. He saved thousands of people's lives. So they were just like, okay, so I guess we're just going to take a break. Um, can't beat that. So they did. They receded into the shadows. And then when he passed away, they were like, ooh, Abdul Baha is not here anymore. We can sow some mischief. So when, I, when Shoghi Effendi became the guardian and the Baha'i world itself was sort of just in shock, reeling from the death of Abdul Baha, weakened with grief, these old covenant breakers from Abdul Baha's time crawled out of their dark recesses and took full advantage of the shock that was caused by the master's passing. Particularly so evil, but so strategic during the eight months that Shoghi Effendi is going to be in Switzerland. And so who's going to be left to deal with them? Yep, the greatest holy leaf. So November 1921 to January 1922, rumblings of covenant breaking. Whew. Puff. In the weeks after Abdul Baha's passing, he and the greatest holy leaf, Shoghi Effendi and the greatest holy leaf, had to manage the awakening and the rumbling of uh, covenant breakings. Abdul Baha had been deeply concerned with covenant breaking in America shortly before his passing. And he, a couple of weeks before he passed away on the 8th of November, 1921, he cabled America, Roy Hilt Wilhelm. <clears throat> and he was, he was responding to a report that there were so many covenant breakers um, that were henchmen of uh, Mirza Muhammad Ali. And Abdul Baha had responded, uh, sent a cable that was three line, three words long that said, certainly shun violators. By the 14th of December, 1921, two weeks after Shoghi Fendi arrived in Haifa, the greatest holy leaf herself sent a message to America with strict instructions. And she said, now is a period of great tests. The friends should be firm and united in defending the cause. Covenant breakers starting activities through press, other channels all over world, select committee of wise, cool heads 
to handle press propaganda in America. So Shoghi Effendi is beginning his guardianship with this volatile covenant breaking situation. Uh, even the High Commissioner for Palestine, Sir Herbert Samuel, demanded to know what was going on with these covenant breakers. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a serious, serious situation. But the worst thing that happens in the next, in the two months following Abdul Baha's um, passing is on the 30th of January, 1922, the covenant breakers steal the keys to the holiest place on earth for Baha'is. They steal the keys to the shrine of Baha'u'llah. Mirza Muhammad Ali had been plotting. He'd been trying to find uh, ways for the civil authorities of Palestine to turn over custodianship of the shrine of Baha'u'llah to him because he said, you know what, I'm the eldest. Uh, I'm actually the half-brother of Abdul Baha. I am much more qualified than Shoghi Effendi and I'm basically next in line of succession. But the British refu authorities refused to act because they thought this was a religious dispute, so they didn't want to get involved. And when Mirza Muhammad Ali applied to the Mufti of Akka, so a religious authority, the Muslim religious authority of Akka, to intervene on his behalf, the Mufti also refused. So that's when Mirza Muhammad Ali sent his younger brother, Mirza Badiullah, along with other covenant breakers. And on Tuesday, the 30th of January, 1922, they stole the keys of the Most Holy Shrine based on their false claim that they were the closest surviving relatives of Baha'u'llah. This act was so despicable and it caused such a commotion in the Baha'i community that the governor of Akka ordered the keys remanded into the hands of the authorities and refused to return them either to Muhammad, Mirza Muhammad Ali or to Shoghi Effendi. So no one could go inside the shrine. They could only stand outside of it. Shoghi Effendi was very distressed but he followed the master's example and calmly gave instructions to place lights inside and outside the shrine, which was being electrified at the time. And the electrification of the shrine had begun while Abdul Baha was still alive. On the 13th of June, 1922, the dispute over the custody of the shrine of Bahala was reported to Winston Churchill, stating a number of telegrams from around the world supporting Shoghi Effendi's claim. So by the 23rd of June, 1922, the government of the British mandate in Palestine was forced to intervene and had a temporary arrangement that the keys should be held by the sub-governor of Akka and be made available to Baha'i pilgrims and visitors. And they posted a guard at the entrance, but they had not yet reached a decision which would not be reached for several months yet. Shoghi Effendi as the Guardian. So uh, I have another little uh, thing to say about this. Um, when I finished uh, Priceless Pearl, every single thing in Priceless Pearl that had a date attached to it was in my chronology. And I was left with about 100 pages of absolutely luminous, extraordinary things that had no date. So I started grouping them by theme and from now until uh, the end of the chronology, really, uh, you are going to uh, see qualities of the Guardian, aspects of the Guardian's personality, the Guardian's uh, work ethic, the Guardian's love of gardens. These are the things that I could not put in the chronology, and I put them at the end of part. So we've reached close to the end of this part. These are very, very long they are very delightful. I wish I could read them to you in their entirety. I cannot because this particular section is 20 pages long, so I can't read you to it. I'm going to select my favorite excerpts, but I really, really hope that you go to the chronology and you read. If you go to the chronology and you come to part five, right? You're in part five. Let me show you. I'll show you how to do this. Hold on. There you go. So you're in part five and you see these numbers on the side. Here, we've done all of this so far, and we've ended with the Covenant Breakers. And now we're going to go to something very pleasant. There's section 10 is Shoghi Effendi as the Guardian. Section 11 is Shoghi Effendi as the Interpreter. 
And section 12 is Shoghi Effendi's approach to his work. These are long sections with a lot of stories that I cannot tell. So I hope you go and look at them because they're wonderful. And they're all from, they're almost all from Ruhia Hanum. And they're so intimate and powerful. The first one is the Alembic of the Guardian's creative mind. Um, this is the way that uh, Ruhia Hanum describes Shoghi Effendi as the Guardian. Ale this is an Alembic here, which I artistically blurred kind of. Um, when you make a tar of rose, which is the essential oil of rose, you put thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of kilos of rose petals in a big copper boiler. And the steam, the fragrant steam that comes out of that goes through an alembic. So it go, it's funneled into a tube and the tube goes around and around and around and it drops, drops, drops into a tar of rose, basically. So... What the what show what the uh, Ruhia Hanum is talking about is that the guardian's mind was like this process. It basically distilled anything, purified it. Essentially, what Ruhia Hanum is saying is that the guardian's mind was transformational and would transform events, writings, um, the Baha'i teachings, his translations, just because of the quality of his mind that had this ability to purify, distill, explain, and cast a, a, a how do you say, free from error? Uh, infallible. Sorry. This is how he created a united, tethered, worldwide Baha'i community that be started out in 1921 as a disparate mass of believers. The Guardian's Station. This is what Shoghi Effendi says about himself. I wish to be known to realize myself, however far I may proceed in the future, as one and only one of the many workers in his vineyard. He also says my birthday should not be commemorated. He also says uh, in a letter from his secretary, concerned Shoghi Effendi station, he surely has none except what the master confers upon him in his will and testament. This is the guardian's infallibility. Uh, in the will and testament, there are no limitations placed on the infallibility of the guardian when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to like translating the Baha'i writings and his interpretation of Baha'u'llah's writings. If he translates a word in Arabic by a word in English, this is infallible. He has complete infallibility in that. And <clears throat> hand of the cause, Leroy Iowis once asked the Guardian if the Guardian's divine guidance was applicable to all matters or just matters relating to the faith. He just basically didn't know where the infallibility began and ended. So when Ruhi Hanum said uh, said the same thing, you know, he, he, Lero Ayas was basically asking, "What are the limits of the of the infallibility?" So he he asked him, and Shoghi Effendi looked at him, opened his eyes very wide, and said, "Leroy, have you not read the will and testament of the Master?" Leroy said, "Yeah, of course, I, many times." And the Guardian said, "Well, what does it say?" And the Guardian said, and so he said that uh, Leroy Iowis answered, while he knew what the Will and Testament said, many Baha'is wanted personal advice on matters, and Shoghi Effendi always advised them to consult experts and follow their advice. And the Guardian said, yes, that is in accordance with the teachings of Baha'u'llah. The Baha'is must consult experts at all times. So then Leroy Iowis pushes forward more, and he says, well, are you guided in all matters or only those of the faith? And he <clears throat> he just pushes and pushes until Shoghi Effendi says, in the will and testament, there are no limitations placed on the infallibility of the guardian. And then on another occasion, Leroy Iowis came back around to the same subject and said, um, said something, and the guardian told him directly, he said, Baha'u'llah, has conferred upon me a power that enables me to know what I need to know, which is remarkably similar to the powers of Abdul Baha, who Baha'u'llah himself had described to a uh, 
a, a mufti or somebody who worked in a mosque, an imam or something, um, who was amazed at Abdul Baha's 15 year old knowledge. And Abdul Baha'u'llah had described it to him by saying, whatever the master needs to know comes in front of him at the moment he needs to know it, like a like a PowerPoint presentation, like a, it just comes in front of his eyes. As soon as he needs one piece of knowledge, if it's, uh, I don't know, uh, the movement of the stars or alchemy, whatever it is he needs to know, it comes in front of him at the moment he needs to know it. Uh, the guardian's mysterious relationship to God. That's basically what the story says, that the guardian had a mysterious relationship with God. The guardian is ahead of a world religion. This one is important. Um, there's a dinner table here because there's a dinner table in the story. Um, <clears throat> the Baha'i faith is a universal independent world religion and its permanent world spiritual and administrative center is situated in the Holy Land. So this makes you... the Baha'i faith unique among all the religions. And the head of the religion, Abdul Baha I, now Shoghi Effendi, were invested with an exalted station that carried with it great prestige. Unfortunately, this was lost on people because the Baha'i faith was not like Christianity or Judaism or Islam. It wasn't huge. It was a small number of people. But the prestige of the Baha'i faith and its prestige in the Holy Land was higher than all of the other religions because both are holy places and our administrative centers are there and our prophets are buried there and we know where they're buried. We have shrines for them. So from... Uh, during his ministry, the Guardian accepted an invitation from the District Commissioner of Haifa for a reception on the occasion of a visit from the High Commissioner. When Shoghi Effendi entered the room, he found that the High Commissioner had taken the seat of honor and there was only one free chair next to him on his right. Because the hosts of the event clearly did not understand the station of the faith, which would seat the world head of the Baha'i faith at the at a place of honor in the gathering, Shoghi Effendi walked up and sat directly in that chair before he could be sat anywhere else. That chair had originally been reserved for the district commissioner. Because Shoghi Effendi knew that during his guardianship, situations like this would only repeat themselves over and over again, this forced him never again to attend a function. Never again to attend a function. This is just a little story just to say that Shoghi Effendi broke with the past. He did not wear the Abba. He did not wear a turban. He did not go to the Friday prayers. He was the first to break with all the central figures and not have a beard. He was not a patriarch. And later, when he comes up with his final signature, he will always sign your true brother Shogi. That is not how Abdul Baha signed his tablets. This is just a little story, and there's a lot more details in here, um, but you can go and read the rest of it. This one I'm going to skip. Shoghi Effendi as interpreter. The Guardian's interpretations of Baha'u'llah's writings. Um, for 36 years, Shoghi Effendi interpreted the writings of Baha'u'llah and offered these gems up to the world. His translations were not translations. They were interpretations. Why? In Arabic, there are like between five and a hundred meanings for one Arabic word. The English word that Shoghi Effendi chooses is the infallible interpretation of that Arabic word for Baha'u'llah. So imagine when the Guardian begins to translate the Kitabi Ikan and the Persian and the hidden words, all of the Persian speakers and Arabic speakers finally know which version of that Arabic word Baha'u'llah had meant. Because even though they speak Arabic and understand Arabic, they themselves didn't know which of the five meanings of this word did Baha'u'llah intend? When the Guardian started translating into English, not only the Americans and the English and the rest of the world and the English-speaking people, but also the Persian and the Arabic-speaking people also began to understand the holy writings better because now they knew which word Baha'u'llah had intended. Shoghi 
Shohi Effendi's inspirational translations. The act of translating Baha'u'llah's peerless Arabic and Persian into elevated, life-giving English that never reads like a translation. When you read Shoghi Effendi's translations, you really think that Baha'u'llah revealed this in English, for sure. That's, that's 18 months in Oxford. <laughs> the Guardian was a master jeweler of words. And he majestically laid out these words, these familiar themes, and imbued them with new significance. And they became something that the Baha'is couldn't even imagine. They found themselves unable to resist pioneering, unable to resist arising to serve, all because of the inspiration and the infallibility of the Guardian's translations. But I'm going to read this one in full because personally, I love this story. This is one of my favorite stories. The Guardian had a very precious and thick loose leaf book in which he kept the most important passages he came across in the writings of Baha'u'llah. This book was the source for quotations for his long letters and God passes by. In 1963, after the interregnum of the Ministry of the Custodians, this priceless book of Shoghi Effendi's was immediately handed over to the Universal House of Justice. Oh, wait, this is the image for that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Shoghi Effendi's Mastery of Four Languages. I want to do a shout out here to my dear, beloved friend and collaborator, Mr. Fuad Izadinia, who was custodian of the Shrine of the Bab for decades in the Holy Land. Um, he helped me write this section. The four languages spoken by the Guardian, Persian, Arabic, English, and French. Uh, French because he went to school in a French Jesuit school. English he learned in uh, still in Haifa and in Beirut and then in um, uh, England. Arabic and Persian, of course. Um, four languages. He spoke French with a perfect French accent. This we have covered. I'm not going to read this. Shogi Effendi's words. Oh, I love this one. This is also one of my favorites. Okay. One of the reasons that the Guardian's writings are so rich and vibrant is Shogi Effendi's love. I think I would go so far as to say passionate love for synonyms. When he was writing, he would often find synonyms for a word he wanted to use. And English it has 65,000 words. French has about 35,000 words. Because French is a Latin language, so it only has words of Latin origin. English is double the size because it had it has words from Latin origin and Germanic origin. So, for example, uh, you have cow and beef, depending on if it's alive or cooked, uh, pork and pig, uh, things like that. They're synonyms, and and they're synonyms because the English has two entire root languages inside of it. That's why it's so huge. So when he was writing, he would often find synonyms for a word that he wanted to use, and he would either choose the Germanic synonym or the Latin synonym. And so he would turn to, to Ruhiya Khanum, and he would say, do you see, do you hear the very subtle difference between these two words? Now this is the word that is proper in this connection. Ruhiya Khanum stated that all the Guardian's writings were perfect. You can't. In the writings of the Guardian, remove a dot from an eye without losing some meaning. He is so precise, so exquisite in his use of the English language. Speaking from a person who was a magnificent writer, Ria Khanum in her own right, 
This one, Shoghi Effendi, as expounder of the writings, I am also going to give you the gift to go read on the chronology because we've talked about it. This is really wonderful. This is really wonderful. I love this story. Shoghi Effendi's meticulousness with the original text. This is a great story. You're going to love it. So, uh, nowhere was Shoghi Effendi more meticulous than in relation to the right, holy writings of the Baha'i faith. When people came up to the guardian, <laughs> I love this. I told you I loved it. When people came up to the guardian with a question about the writings, the guardian would say, where did you get that from? If he hadn't translated the writing a Baha'i was talking about, Shoghi Effendi would not vouch for its authenticity and would make no comment, but rather would say, I have to see the original. I love this. The Guardian had such a tremendous respect for the original holy writings of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha that it must have seemed baffling to Baha'is for the Guardian to say, where did you get that from? I have to see the original. What? The Guardian? He's infallible. He should know. No, this is his respect for the original. Holy this is why the Utterance Project is so important. I'm going to plug Adib in my project. We have worked so hard on this. Go on YouTube, listen to the long healing prayer in Arabic. The entire thing rhymes line by line. And it also lines, rhymes within the lines. That's the original Arabic. That's the magic. It's so powerful. Uh, last section of, for tonight, Shoghi Effendi's approach to his work. Um, this one, I may spill over a little bit over the hour and a half because there's some things here that I really want to share with you that are very important. I am choosing very, I know this thing by heart, and I'm choosing very specifically the items that I think are going to be very important for you to remember for the rest of this chronology, because we're, this, the interpreter and his love of words and his approach to his work, we're, we're setting the foundation for understanding Shoghi Effendi as much as our feeble human minds can understand him. His centrifugal force is one of those things I really want you to become familiar with because it's extremely important. Um, many Baha'is mistakenly thought Shoghi Effendi was a quiet person. Quiet, prayerful meditative, maybe moving a little slow and peaceful, you know, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Hand of the cause and Secretary General of the International Baha'i Council later on, Leroy Iowas, was the Guardian's right-hand man for five years from 1952 to 1957. And he was a person closest to Shoghi Effendi aside from Ruhia Hanum and William Sutherland Maxwell. The Guardian loved Leroy Iowa so much that he called him my Hercules because he did things that were impossible. The Guardian, um, Shogi, Leroy Iowa described Shoghi Effendi as constantly in motion, the heart of a centrifugal force that swept up all those who were associated with him. The Guardian was a man of action. First and foremost, it was his most distinguishing characteristics. Later in talks, Leroy Iowas would say, the secret of meditation and prayer, no, the Guardian would say, the secret of meditation and prayer is action. It is only through action that God can answer your prayer. So you can't pray and pray and pray and sit and be like, why is my prayer not being answered? You know, it's kind of like the guy who prays and prays and prays to God to win a lottery ticket. Then the guy finally croaks. He dies. He goes to heaven and he says to God, God, you abandoned me. I prayed my entire life for a lottery ticket and you never let me win. And then God says to him, well, you never bought a ticket. So the guardian's power was action. Your prayers are answered with, sure, you're immobile and you're silent or you chant your prayers, but then you have to act for divine guidance to flow through you. You cannot be immobile. And the guardian's power was radiating from him constantly. He was always moving forward. He always had the spiritual energy that drove him ever forward, ever forward. 
Um, Leroy Iowis said that to be that close to that amount of raw power and to live near that irrepre irrepre irrepressible, irrepressible force was not an easy thing. No one could ever achieve a drop of what the Guardian did. My favorite talk, my favorite Baha'i talk, 21 June 1970. Look it up online. It's online. The whole recorded talk and the transcripts. 21 June 1970, Ruhiya Hanum speaks to the youth in America. And she says that what she believed was Shoghi Effendi's genius in that talk, she says, is his, quote, capacity for a tremendous amount of persevering work. This is very important. This is so important. Um, this is kind of similar. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, <laughs> I love this. You know why I love this? Because I was close to the end of the chronology when I was writing this. And I realized I have the same setup as Shoghi Effendi. And I never knew about this ever before. But let me tell you the setup of, Sh of Shoghi Effendi. And then you're going to laugh with me. It's all in one place, basically. Shoghi Effendi's bed and his desk were side by side. Mine are too. <laughs> So, and this is what I do actually too, so that he could go from his bed to his desk, from his desk to his bed, um, and he could continue working like seamlessly and get just so much work done because they're not in two different places. Oh, uh, you know what? Actually, when I read this bit from Priceless Pearl, I screamed so loud. My parents came into my room to see what happened. And I told them, I have the same setup as Shogi Fendi. <laughs> In 20 years, Ruhiya Hanum never managed to convince Shoghi Effendi, 20 years of marriage, Ruhiya Hanum never convinced Shoghi Effendi to separate his bedroom from his office. It was the way he worked, and it worked for him until the day he died. He once told Ruhiya Hanum, I can't help it. It's all in one place. I can get into bed and get out of bed and do my work. Shoghi Effendi's genius. Ah, oh, this is a beautiful picture of the Matterhorn. The Matterhorn, a famous Swiss Alp mountain that was Shoghi Effendi's favorite. Um, Amatul Bahariya Hanu makes a very important point in separating Shoghi Effendi's spiritual heritage as the descendant from the family of the Bab and the direct descendant of Baha'u'llah from his person. Shoghi Effendi was the great grandson of Baha'u'llah and the grandson of Abdul Baha. He has a unique heritage of spiritual power and divine guidance. And as the guardian, he was infallible. But she defines him as a genius. And I want you to hear what she says. It's from this talk from 21 June 1970. Go look at that talk. You're not going to regret it. It's absolutely phenomenal. This is Ruhiya Hanum speaking. I think one of the definitions of genius is a person who has the capacity for a tremendous amount of persevering work. You know, in science, in art, in music, in literature, if you study those people that get to the very top and are outstanding, so often it has been done by a very, very simple process of just hard work. And this is how Ruhiya Hanum describes his powers of concentration. I have never in my life seen anybody with the power of work and concentration the Guardian had. And it was really an example to all of us. He just kept at it until he did it. He drove through until he succeeded. Whatever it was, it didn't matter what the nature of the thing was. Whether it was having a wall built or having the side of a mountain demolished and carted away or something he was writing or something he was going to write. And he was doing a tremendous amount of reading and making notes. He did it all the slow, thorough way. And that's why you have so much that he's accomplished. And it's of such high caliber in every field. It's a very short story here. I'm going to tell you too. Shoghi Effendi's organization. I love Legos. So I just put Lego bricks here. 
Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi were practical in the extreme. Shoghi Effendi was brilliant, dynamic administrator and executor who planned very carefully and kept track of everything, the details and the big picture. As we like to say in English, the forest and the trees. He was careful. He was exact. He was methodical. He picked objectives. He was thorough in carrying out his plans, big or small, and he followed through to reach his goal. As Ruhia Hanum said, this was typical of his executive capacity of Shoghi Effendi. His attention to detail, as I said, his thoroughness, his carrying out of plans, his foreseeing what could happen, making a plan, making an objective, following through to each to reach that objective. So, so organized. Hold on, let me just look real quick and see how many pick. Oh my God, I have like 10 more stories. Okay, uh, let me see. Am I going to tell this one? <laughs> yes, I love this story. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to tell you all the ones I love. Shogi Effendi did not rely on anyone's judgment but his own. Um, but he was always very, very, very exact. Like he would ascertain exactly the time that Nauru started. So we would cable his cousin in Beirut, ascertain and wire exact time vernal equinox. Boom. Sometimes he needed data for something he was writing. So then in 1932, he cabled his friend who was uh, who was in the who had access to the library of the American University in Beirut in Lebanon and said, ascertain approximate population Roman Empire during two first centuries after Christ. I love that. We would ask this question to Google now, right? But he would wire his cousin in Beirut. Um, see, I'm wondering, I found this, I, I got obsessed with this. Like I spent, I swear, I took a break from the chronology and for an entire day, I tried to find where he would have used this population of the Roman Empire. And I think I may have found it. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I found it in one of his messages to the Baha'i world. And he talks about the Roman Empire. Uh, he talks about... Uh, uh, Oh, oh no! I want to. I don't want to tell that. This is um, this is very very sweet. Um, when he was showing the 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 the, the victories of the Baha'i faith, he talked about how far south uh, the Baha'i faith had reached, and he was very very exact. He quoted the latitude because he he went and found the latitude to be that precise in his description of the of the victory. So this is about the widely disseminated literature of seven books have lately been presented by an adherent of the faith residing in Christchurch, New Zealand, to the officer in charge of the American Antarctic Expedition for its library. While others have been dispatched beyond the Antarctic Circle, listen to this, listen how precise this is, just listen. Beyond the Antarctic Circle, as far south as the expedition's base, at McMurdo Sound, 77 degrees latitude on the shores of the Ross Sea. So he consulted at least two books to get all those details. Uh... <laughs> this is not, I'm going to tell this one because it has to do with Africa. Uh, Shogi Effendi's encouragement to pioneers. Africa, South Africa, Johannesburg. This is a great story. Uh, Shoghi Effendi absolutely loved pioneers. Loved, loved, loved them. Kept lists of them in his little notebooks. One day, a woman asked Shoghi Effendi where she should, if he could suggest a place for her and her husband to go pioneering. And listen to how Shoghi Effendi determines the destiny of this woman, her husband, their children, the entire family with four words. So she asked Shoghi Effendi, where should I go pioneering? Shoghi Effendi immediately responds, Africa. The woman asked, any particular place in Africa? Shoghi Effendi replies, South Africa. The woman asks again, any particular city? Shoghi Effendi responds, Johannesburg. That was it. Four words and the family's destiny has changed forever. Um, mm, 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 mm. I have time to tell these two. This is a little story about the personal friendships of Shoghi Effendi with royalty and eminent personalities. 
Shoghi Effendi was in touch with members of European royalty. He was in touch with Queen Marie of Romania, Princess Marina of Greece. Uh, Duchess of Kent, Princess Kadria of Egypt, Lord Lamington, Orientalist, etc., Lady Samuel, Sir Ronald Storrs. So for his whole life, he had like he would write to to, to royalty, and there's there's a story later on. Um, <clears throat> and the last story I want to tell you, and before I tell the story, I want to do a little aside. Um, I just got a text message on my phone from my father, who says that um, these stories are going too far into the future of the life of Shogi Effendi. That's done on purpose. Um, I want you to know who Shogi Effendi was uh, in full, even though I'm progressing chronologically and we're still in 1922 in the story and he's still 25 and none of these people he's met, you know, he's not married to Ruhi Hanum yet. He's not, his secretary is not Leroy Iowas, but you may disagree with my choice. This is how I wrote the chronology. I wanted people to be able to read the chronology, but also get an idea of how amazing the Guardian was. And that meant that I had to go beyond the years. So the, a lot of these stories take place in the, 50, in the 50s or in the 40s. But um, yeah, because if I'm just leaving you with Shogi Effendi at 24, you don't know how absolutely extraordinary the things he's going to accomplish is. And I want you to know. So this is going to happen for several parts. Um, I'm not going to change it. I'm going to keep doing it. I stand by my editorial decision. I think it's important to mix it up. This is not a strict chronology in that sense. Um, the last story for today is Shogi Effendi's sleep, lack of sleep. He wanted to sleep more than he did. Is what our guardian, he wanted to sleep more than he did. That is how Ruhia Hanum beautifully addressed Shoghi Effendi's sleep. As Shoghi Effendi's ministry advanced, the burden of his work increased. The problems he faced were greater. The more the work was more arduous until he had to read three hours a day, every day to keep abreast of what was happening. Many, many times, Shoghi Effendi told Ruhia Hanum, Oh, if I could just once more sleep the sleep of my youth, if I could just once more sleep 10 hours. Dear friends, we've just finished part five of The Guardian. Uh, part six is for next Saturday, next Sunday. It's going to be The Guardian, part six, 1922 to 1924, the state of the worldwide Baha'i administrative order as Shoghi Effendi uh, takes over.